Welcome to Leaders Lead Podcast. Are you ready to conquer your challenges and achieve greatness? Join us as we dive into inspirational stories of industry leaders who have overcome adversity and reached new heights. Get ready for electrifying insights and captivating conversations that will ignite your passions for success. This is your go-to show for empowerment, growth, and leadership. Buckle up. Leaders Lead Podcast is here to take you on a transformational ride. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to Leaders Lead the Podcast. I'm super excited. I have uh, Tony Watley to speak to today. Tony, if I butchered your name, dude, please tell me. Did I get it right? All right, cool. I got it right. I'm really inspired by Tony. And the reason that I thought that I would bring Tony in is so that we can kind of squash, squash all these excuses that we have on why we can't get what we want, right? If y'all know and y'all heard my story, uh, I was working as a, a corporate exec. At least that's the title that they gave me. I didn't really feel like an executive. I felt kind of like, like an outsider. I was living in somebody else's dreams. I had be- become somebody else's purpose. And I had all the excuses in the world until one day I'm under my desk crying <laughs> on the phone with my wife because I'm so miserable because I did not follow my purpose. I was not living in my joy, but somebody else's. And then boom, it happened. I don't want the same thing to happen to you. (laughs) I want you to get to that way, way, way before that. And so that's why I hired a private gun to come in and and help me with this because I'm a little too close to this this subject. It's only been a few years (laughs) for me. So I didn't want to break down and start crying, but we're going to give you some execution strategies so that you can unlock your true superpower and follow your true joy. And that's what my buddy Tony is going to do for us today. What's up, brother? Hey, man. Tony Taylor. I love your name. I don't know why. It's just it's a great name. That's a great name, brother. <laughs> Tony, Tony Taylor, Tony Watley, the two Tonys, man. We, uh, I'm, I, I love your background, man. That's, that's really cool. That is 365 driven. That is, uh, I, I like that. I like that. Uh, Thank you. What's, what's your story, man? How did you get here? You know, I'm an accidental entrepreneur because nobody in my family had any money. And I just had to figure things out. And luckily, my parents were very supportive of me when I was little. I was kind of the hustler and was out knocking doors, walking dogs, washing cars, mowing yards, raking leaves, whatever I could. Because you know, my mom and dad they didn't have any money. My mom was a Japanese immigrant. She worked in the public school systems as a cafeteria worker. So she was the lunch lady. And my dad was a U.S. Marine combat vet from Vietnam. And after that, he worked right. in the chemical refineries. And so I got to see two hardworking blue collar parents that just really taught me the values of hard work and trying to figure things out. And, you know, they were all for me to go figure things out. because They weren't going to give me no allowance and all that kind of crap. And literally the first three houses that I grew up in were fixer uppers. I mean, we'd call these flip houses nowadays because that's like the buzz trend. But we would literally buy the crappiest house on the street and live in it while my sister and myself and my parents would kind of restore the house over a period of years. And then once my sister and I started growing a little bit too big, they upsized a little bit bigger house. I mean, the first one was like a thousand square foot. Another one was 1200 square foot. And I think the last one was 2000 square foot. So not very big homes all the way through my college you know, years. So you know, I grew up with that kind of a, a humble gratitude, loved what I had, even if it wasn't a lot. And, you know, entrepreneurship for me was just like, you know, how do I make extra money? I was just thinking about this kind of stuff. And my passion for cars is what really started the first companies that I started. And, you know, I put myself through school as a welder, as a pipe fitter, as a waiter, as a mechanic. And I got an engineering degree and I got in the oil and gas industry here in the Houston, Texas area. And I just didn't really have a creative outlet. I just was making a little minimal entry level salary. And Mm -hmm. I just knew that I wanted to take more control over my life, my results, and my lifestyle. And, you know, guys, I wanted that nicer car. I wanted the Trans Am or the Camaro that I couldn't afford, the things I would daydream about when I was a kid. And so I just created these businesses. And initially, they were just like most people's side businesses. They were building widgets or whatever at the kitchen table and wasting time and, you know, trying to, you know, put things out there on the internet, which was kind of new back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And 
you know, just things didn't scale very well, but I could maybe make a hundred dollars extra a week or three hundred dollars extra a week. So it really just replaced my waiting tables type, you know, my side job. Because prior to that, I would work even with an engineering degree. I would work and I would get off around four thirty, and I would go work at the restaurant from six to ten p.m. like every night. Because the answer is that is like I, I just wasn't where I wanted to be. And instead of sitting on the couch and complaining about the situation, I just put the apron on and went to work seven days a week after my normal job. Wow. Wow. Dude. So I got, what I got from that was that you are a worker and you've always, you've always worked. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. And yeah. So I, yeah, I, I've been doing a lot about doing a lot of research about value, value words, things that, that people value. And I've, I've come to the conclusion or almost at a conclusion that the things that, that we value are the things that that we get done, right? And you having that that blue collar background, uh, you, you're immigrant, uh, immigrant. Your dad was a freaking marine. How much of that that work from your background and and from your parents? How much of that work goes hand in hand in what you do right now? If if it does or it don't. Man, I'm a product of two extreme levels of disciplinarian parents. Okay, I'm very fortunate for that. And early when I was young, I didn't like that. Nobody likes to be disciplined. Nobody likes that kind of stuff. Nobody likes to be told what to do, right? And to give you a level of discipline examples, my mom, you hear the, you hear the Asian tiger mom type stories out there. It's so true because my mother, being a Japanese woman of her era, the baby boomer generation, women in Japan were really not held to the same standard as men, and they were kind of like second-class citizens. So they didn't get the full education that men did at that same era. So most of the women got really a junior high-level education, and then they got to work in the farms. They worked in the farms, you know, it was hard work. And so she really valued education because she didn't have that. And so she wanted for my sister and I to have good education. That's why we're living in those really crappy houses, because we moved to school districts that were actually decent school districts that we just really couldn't afford to live in those towns. So we had to find a way to get in. And I'm very thankful for my mom and dad for making those sacrifices to live in crap ass houses so we could get a good education. So to give you an example of the education levels, like I didn't make a, a C in grades until I made it to college when I was paying for it for myself. Engineering school, and I thought my life was over making a C. Like a B minus was like, you might as well just go jump off a bridge. Like you're letting us down here. Okay. So all the things that we hear about Asian moms and, and get this guy's like, I didn't miss a single day of school from kindergarten through graduation. I had perfect attendance for 13 years. Wow. You think I liked that? No, I didn't. But probably three or four years into that, I started realizing like, hey, this is actually pretty cool. Not many people are doing this. Maybe I'll go for a record. Maybe I can adopt the identity of having perfect attendance and just showing up every day, rain or shine, you know, and not having excuses. And and I did. I had perfect attendance. My sister did as well. It wasn't just me. It was a family thing. It was a cultural thing that we created. And, you know, soon enough, when you, your parents and you're out there and you're letting your kids slack off and cut corners and skip school, they're going to adopt the identity, unfortunately, of people that cut corners and skip out on their careers and their lives and relationships later on. So you need to hold them to a higher standard, even if you didn't have that for yourself. Because if you can do that for a period of time, they're going to start to identify identify as that. They're going to start to be like, I'm someone that shows up. I'm someone that never skips. I'm someone that strives to be competitive and get better grades. And that's the what you, that's what you want is your kids and all your, your friends to adopt, adopt identities that are constructive. And behave. Wow. Now you, you said that so, so beautifully. And I, um, I kind of fast forward it in my mind, as far as, you know, me, when I first started as an entrepreneur, the consistency you know, the, the, the consistency with starting the podcast, there are some times I'm like, okay, I'm not going to post this week. And then it's just like, why, why, why am I not? Is it because, yeah, you know, this stuff and my studio broke down or the fact that I didn't have a studio yet, or the fact that I didn't have a fancy mic, or I can go on and on. And that's what I hear a lot of, uh, beginning entrepreneurs, uh, they go on and on or folks that, or, you know, working in that corporate space or managing others, uh, they, they don't have that, that consistency uh, piece. And it's just, it's just so hard for them 
And I would imagine you coming from the background that you came from, like, how do you feel when, when you see people making those mistakes and how do you, and how do you help them or can they even be helped? What can, what can we do to help them right now? Yeah. First of all, I wanted to acknowledge something about the word consistency and how important that is to me. I actually, we have these little rubber bracelets that we give out at our events. Mm-hmm. And I know you probably can't see unless you zoom in, but one side says 365 driven, obviously that's branding. Oh. But on the other side, it says consistency. Ooh. That's how Ooh. important this is. That is the key word to everything. And, you know, I think a lot of times people are out there trying to look for that silver bullet or the magic potion or the get rich quick or whatever. They're always looking for the shiny object. We see a lot of that going on out there. But what it all comes back down is the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. And the problem with the word consistency is that we understand that from an early age. We understand what that means. Show up consistently, consistently work hard, consistently perform, do things every day, take little mm-hmm. steps, and you'll cover a lot of time and a lot of distance in a, in a longer time. And so the problem is that the word is so often used and understood that we disregard it mm-hmm. because we think, oh, yeah, I'm consistent. I, I'm looking for the, th- I'm not where I'm, wa- I'm not where I, I want to be, but I, I know what the word consistent is, but it's, it can't be that because I understand that concept and that's just not there because I don't have the results yet. So we go out there and we look for a bunch of BS and we try to figure things out and shortcut this and buy the fake followers and all this crap, right? But what it all boils down to is just doing the fundamentals, the consistency very well. So executing that will change your life, whether that's your wealth, your health, your relationships, your mindset. Anything is based on consistency. And to me, that's the brand there, 365 driven. Showing up every day. It's not about hustling, grinding, and killing yourself every day. It's about just putting some effort in every single day to improve and move closer to your goals. So that word is a big, big word for me. Yes. Yes. I love, I love that you said that. And I was just going to show you. I don't know if you could see this, but I'm, I'm taking notes on you because dude, uh, you, I think what you're doing is so amazing. And I really want our, our listeners and our viewers to really take in like these, these gems that you're giving us. Before you even show me the wristband, I had wrote uh, consistency and I circled it because that's what, I, that's what I'm getting from you is, is, is the, the art of being consistent. I saw an interview or maybe it was a piece of content. You mentioned that you were a millionaire right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Because a lot of people, you know, that's a, that's a good benchmark for them. Yeah. Did you have any obstacles when you were in route to that million mark? Any kind of thing that was, that was holding you back at, at all? Like what did you have to overcome? Cause I'm pretty sure it was hell at times, right? Th- there has been some setbacks and lessons learned and expensive things that go along with any kind of business. But, you know, to give you context for that business side of the backstory, I created an online community back in 2001. And it was about cars, performance cars, ls1tech.com. Anybody likes General Motors, Chevrolet, Pontiac, Cadillac, those fans. I created the largest website on the internet. It still exists to this day. And we had over 300,000 registered members. And then I took that same business model and I created performancetrucks.net, which also still exists. And that would grew to 280,000 registered members. So we had a lot of eyeballs. And to give you an idea of how much traffic that website generated on a daily basis, we had over 100,000 people visiting every single day. So if you imagine this visually, if you're going to create a business on Main Street, USA, uh-huh. imagine 100,000 people walking through your front door every single day. That's how busy this website is. And so with that amount of traffic, that amount of attention, I was able to generate advertising revenue from Cadillac and General Motors and Chevrolet and all the tire companies and all the speed shops and performance shops and manufacturers all around the country, around the world for that matter. And we had over 150 advertising accounts at that time. And this is something I just did in my spare time, guys. I made a seven-figure business, which I sold for a couple million in only a few more years building something that I just enjoyed. And so where I'm going with this is like you talk about the millionaire. I think that's a good goal to shoot for. I really do. But the thing is, is that I didn't intend to become a multimillionaire because of that business. I just did something that I loved. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of passion for it. I had a lot of energy for it. I could talk about cars all day and how to make them go faster and how you can become a better driver, which wheels look better and why you should do these options and 
how to do things yourself, right? And how to create this content around that. And so that's what I did. And then I just wanted to create the place for all these other people that had the same fanatic type mindset around cars to all hang out somewhere on the internet and talk about the same thing that they had a lot of passion for. So I'm a community builder. I think about what can I build for people to show up? I want to build this virtual bar, so to speak, for people to show up and hang out and meet some of their best friends and share information. And that's what made millions of dollars. I was creating value for people that was entertaining for them that they can learn and build relationships for. And all these sponsors, the ones that are paying me, they are millions of dollars. There's so many companies that started just because they started being an advertiser on our website. So I've literally created dozens and dozens and dozens of multimillionaires over the last 20 years because of some idea that I had. Wow. Wow. And it sounds like you, you follow your, your passion. You, you follow your passion and your passion built the community, right? And as you were saying, as you were talking, I wrote down community. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's pretty cool because like you mentioned earlier, uh, there are people that go out there buy a couple thousand followers so that they can get their, so they get the brand going and they, they do some, some things, uh, some tricking around. Have you ever did that? What's the benefit? If not, like what's the benefit of building community? Because I kind of think that's where you're going to go with it is the community aspect over the follower count. Is that right? Yeah. Let me give you the idea here because I think a lot of people think that community and followers is the same thing. I mean, nowadays people focus on followers and likes through the vanity metrics, right? Mm -hmm. So I want you to visualize something. Okay. So the influencer business model, the, the popularity contest, it's a pyramid and the influencer standing at the top of the pyramid and his arms are straight out like I'm the champion and all you guys down below me are here for me and watching my content and it's a one-way conversation. It's, it's all about me, right? If I scroll through your Instagram feed and the photos are only about you, you only care about you. That's pretty easy. It's pretty evident. So uh -huh. you scroll through my Instagram feed, you see that I feature the people that have been on my show. I got my friends that I'm featuring and sharing their content because it's not about me. It's about building other people. And so from that pyramid business model with the guy standing on the thing, thinking a one-way conversation, it's just that influencer talking to the audience. And it's not the other way around. The audience is not really talking back. There's no conversation there. So that's the influencer business model. That's the followers business model. A community builder has less ego about that. They go, you know what? It's still a pyramid. It's still a pyramid, but it's an upside down pyramid. And the community owner standing on the ground floor, arms stretched up, holding the upside down pyramid. Uh -huh. He's there to facilitate and create and support that community. And it's not about him or her. It's about, I'm creating the virtual bar. I'm creating the community for all of you to show up. And my goal is for each and every one of you in my membership to become best friends with each other. Even if I'm not part of that conversation, I want you guys to be recognized and loved and endeared when people show up and they recognize you. And I, I'm trying to facilitate that by creating content or creating live events or creating things where you just keep showing up because you know that all your friends are hanging out. It's no different than why we go to Facebook now, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're hanging out with our friends. Mark Zuckerberg built a community for us to keep coming back to see where our friends are hanging out. That's why Instagram is not really like that. It's kind of, you kind of see what people are doing, but it's really a one-way conversation on Instagram when you think about that. It's not like interaction like Facebook has, right? Yeah. So, Community builder is not about ego. It's not about followers. It's about multiple ways of conversations instead of that one way. Wow. Beautiful. So Tony, how, how do I as an entrepreneur, how do you profit off of the community versus the other way around the, the follower method, which, I, which sounds kind of like the easiest short term, but yeah, how do we profit off of it? So do you pay to use Facebook? No. So it's free for billions of people. Do you pay to use Instagram? Nope. It's free for billions of people, but they've created a place that's sticky that makes people want to keep coming back and contributing their content. So it's user generated content from people who are not paying a dime, but they're getting value from that. They're getting entertainment. They're getting escapism. They're networking. They're seeing what's going on. They're getting education and it's not costing them anything. So what do you do? You run ads. You you sell ads, you create advertisers, because if you can create a place that's getting a lot of attention, whether that's your email list or a newsletter or an app or something, or even a Facebook group, right? 
if you get enough attention, like I was telling you earlier, about 100,000 people showing up through my virtual door every day, I can sell those ads for more and more money to people that want to be in front of that audience. And that's why when we're scrolling Facebook, we're scrolling Instagram, we're scrolling TikTok, every fourth post nowadays is an advertisement. Yeah. So they're getting paid every time somebody sees that ad. So that's how you monetize a community. Hey, this is Tony Taylor, the host of Leaders Lead the Podcast and also the owner of speakuniversity.org. Let me tell you about our fantastic partners at Holosale Technologies. They are your one-stop shop for IT solutions. When it comes to data security, communications, and privacy, they are on top of the game. Holosale's approach is all about crafting customized white glove solutions that perfectly fit your specific software and use cases, all developed and implemented to the highest absolute standards. It's simple, folks. With Holosale Technologies, you'll get all the data and communication solutions you need without the headache. Give it up to our friends at Holosale Technologies. Okay. I love it. I love it, man. I'm, I'm, I'm getting some freaking jewels here, man. I'm on my second page of notes. So what are you doing specifically for some of the small business owners or some of the, the folks that are thinking about uh, opening up their, their shop? Like, what do you do to, to help them? So 365 Driven is an entrepreneurship community. It's, uh, we have a mastermind group. We've got a Facebook group with 4,000 members. I've also got a paid group that's a little bit smaller. I've got masterminds that are six to eight people each. And also I've got the private one-on-one -on -one coaching. We do live events. I've got the podcast that reaches thousands of people an episode. We're doing live events around the world. We actually just got back from Portugal last week looking at some sites for our next potential event. We'll probably be in May or June of this next coming year. And so... We're always looking for ways to build community and get people off of their keyboards, come out there, network with each other, meet some amazing speakers and guests, interact with them for three to four days in a bucket list destination type location. Because I know that most business owners don't take vacations, unfortunately, and they need nope. to. So my wife and I, who love to travel on our own, we're like, hey, why don't we just create these vacations for them, which have a day of speaking, a day of exploring the place we're in, a day of networking and enjoying the facility that we're at. And that can be a complete 100% write-off because that's a business conference or business education write-off versus a vacation. So we created that form. We've done four events of those. We've whitewater rafted in Montana. We've hiked in Utah. We rented out a road racing school in Arizona and did a day of professional racing instruction. And we've done <laughs> all kinds of stuff like that. We did one in Cancun like so people could get the beach thing. And, and so we like to create exciting things for people. And so... I'm building that community and this is my legacy play. I love doing what I do and the small business owners, man, we have offerings for the startup, for the people that are the six and seven, then the eights and the nines. So, you know, talking about like where people are getting started, you said a lot of your audiences, people that may be thinking about starting a business or maybe the early stages. I mean, my book, Side Hustle Millionaire is perfect for that audience because it literally takes you from ideation, which looking at the ideas that you have for businesses and learning how to assess those against each other to find the one that's going to get the best odds of success. And then it kind of handholds you and kind of walks you through the steps. Like here's an LLC versus an S corp. Here's how you get a funding for this. Here's how you should do your branding. Here's some general purposes for your website layout and things like that. So I really want people to get started. And that's why I wrote that. Beautiful, beautiful. Y'all go get the book. I'm certainly going to get it. Uh, where can we get the book? Is it on Amazon? It's on Amazon or you can get it at Barnes & Noble online. So. Okay. Side hustle millionaire. Um, I'm willing to, to guess there's a lot of tricks and how to, how to make millions while you're still working for a company and eventually stepping out, right? Well, yeah, it's kind of like what we did the when you talked about the intro to this show, you talked about excuses and that's mindset related. Yeah. To me, mindset is the most important part of entrepreneurship or success in general. Yeah. That's why even in my book, the first two chapters cover excuse and, and mindset. So it's like the foundation that we have to build before you can get ahead. Yeah, dude, that is so good. I'll tell you, you know, with everything that we talked about today, the excuses and consistency and the, the education, I, I really feel that 
if we're going to get all of that and we're going to get to that place, we have to have the, the proper mindset uh, to do so, have to have the systems to do it. I mean, there are so many times where dude, it was just so hard for me to come to this, this microphone. And I, I looked up and I'm just like, damn, man, I, I, I still showed up and I still did it. And I was able to, to reap the benefits. And uh, there's times where people would be like, how are you able to, to still do what you're doing? And I'm just like, I'm just doing the things that, that bring me joy, doing the things that I'm passionate about. And, uh, you know, something else that you touched on and, and building community. There's so many people that come on this show that I'm texting on a daily basis. And, you know, we're working out uh, some, some pretty big deals together. <laughs> and we spent 30 minutes together. But here we are uh, closing in on some big deals. But that's all uh, because of community. And, I'm, man, I'm so glad uh, to be in community uh, with you. I, man, dude, I had no idea. I knew. But I didn't know as much that I would be so blown away today uh, by you, man. I, I love what you're building. I love freaking everything that you stand for. So, man, I just want to um, uh, give you your freaking flowers here today, man. If you haven't heard it uh, in a while, you haven't heard it this hour, man. You're amazing. And I'm truly, truly inspired by you, brother. I appreciate that, Tony. Those are, those are kind words. and. You know, I'm always thinking of value. And I want to add to the thing that you said at the beginning of that segment right there. You talked about sometimes you don't feel like getting on the microphone or sometimes you don't feel like creating that content or that post. And I'll share a story so that the listeners can understand why people like yourself and myself do these things. Okay. Yes, sir. When I, when I left corporate in 2015 and I started making content around 2017, one of my former coworkers reached out to me and he's like, man, I really enjoy the content you're creating out. It's, it's inspiring. And he goes, but I couldn't do that. I mean, how do you, how do you do that? See, that's the same question, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I thought about it and I responded back and it was a text message. And I said, Hey, Brian, do we, do you still have the same boss that we have? Is she still there? And he's like, yeah, she's still here. And it's like, okay, cool. So let's say that she came up to you at eight o'clock in the morning, right when you get there. And she said, Hey, Brian, if you take out your phone and you make a, a two-minute video, I'll let you go home for the rest of the day. Would you do that? He's like, oh, hell yeah, I'll, I'll do that. It's like, damn right you would. And so it becomes your job. When you're an entrepreneur and when you're out there creating content and marketing, it's just like your job. Like, it is my job. It is your job. It's our duty as entrepreneurs, as business owners, to create the content. It's, it's just different from our old job. It's just a new roles and responsibility for our chosen career now. And when he asked said that, he's like, that makes a lot more sense because I'm obligated as a performer of this company, as a CEO of the company, to go do what's required. And if that's required, that's my job. Yes. Yes. If it's required, then, then it's your job. What about the folks that, this, this is kind of in my lane too, but the folks that are just like, man, I'm, I'm not comfortable uh, talking, talking on camera. And I ask you this because I almost feel like that's a requirement. <laughs> Do you believe it too? Absolutely. I, I'm actually very, uh, I'm very experienced in this actual fear of criticism, a fear of judgment, and the fear of things like that. I had stage fright up to about 2017. And why did that change? Okay. You know, I have a skin condition called vitiligo. It's actually what Michael Jackson had, you know, where you cover with white spots and Mm -hmm. And those parts you don't tan. So whenever I do have a tan, I look like I'm camouflaged. It's probably why I like to wear camo clothes, right? It's a little funny. Now, I, I'm dealing with, I deal with it, right? But I've had it my whole life. And people would always see you and ask you what's wrong with you. So you kind of get in. You just realize, like, I don't, I don't, don't want to be in the spotlight. Like, I don't want to have to answer this question to a thousand people, much less one person. But I'm just going to be the MVP in the background and become successful and make these millions behind my brand and hide behind my logo and all that stuff. And I did all that stuff and I was very good at it. And I was very good at navigating the corporate ladder and get on the executive path and making multiple six figure salaries. And I was good at that stuff, but I didn't have to be in the spotlight. I didn't have to be on stage. I didn't have to have the ego or the, the followers to be able to become successful. But what happened in 2015, I was racing cars and I hit a concrete wall at 130 miles per hour. And in that moment, when I was approaching the wall, I thought I was going to die in that moment. I was in a two-door sports car, hit, about to hit a concrete wall. These are bad odds, right? And so 
having survived that accident and thinking about my potential death afterward for the days and the weeks to follow, I started doing a soul searching thing. I said, man, what if I would have died right there? What, what would have happened? Like, how would my family or my, my, my son or my friends, what would they think about me? You know? Mm. And you start, well, I don't know. What would they think about me? So just like any of us, we start to compare with our friends group. I mean, we, we all have friends and family that passed away that we kind of compare ourselves to. What did they say about that person? What would they think about that person? Well, it became pretty quick, and I started thinking about what they would say about me was nice, rich guy, cool cars, gone too soon. And when you start to think about, man, is that good enough? That's not nice, enough. Ri- nice, rich guy, cool cars, gone too soon. Because that's what everybody else was remembered by, right? Yeah. My comparison. Yeah. And for me, that was like the blinking neon light, just like on the back of my wall right now, that that's not enough, man. Like you could have impacted far more people in this world than just the, the close network of friends and the former staff members that you taught and the, the small group of people that you mentor. It's like, so why aren't you doing that? Why are you not impacting the world? Yeah. And the answer is because I didn't want to deal with criticism. You had to be in my inner circle and I had to trust you before I was willing to go help you and do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so why was I afraid of criticism? Well, we all have insecurities. Mm-hmm. We all have them. Every one of us has them. Even the people that act like they don't have them, they've got them. Mm-hmm. And so we don't fear failure, everybody. We don't fear failure. We fail you all the time. Like if you eat a bad meal, you fail. You, your shoelace comes untied, you fail. You, you leave the light on, you fail. Like we fail all the time. We recover from that pretty quick. But what we do fear is what people are going to think or say about our failure. So we goes back to other people. What do other people think about me? What are they going to see about me? Mm-hmm. And here's the, here's the mind-blowing part. So. If you think about mortality and that we have a limited time left and you're hiding essentially from the criticism or the fear of criticism from other people, and that's what's keeping you from going out there to do something and pursue your life, those people are not going to be at your funeral, man. Those people, those critics, they're not going to be at your funeral. They're not going to be at your deathbed on your last few hours. They're not going to be there when it matters for you. So why are you hiding from them and why are you letting them dictate your actions in your life? Mm-hmm. And when you start to reframe that those critics don't matter, you start to focus on the 95% of the people that do support you or at least accept you and have good intentions about things and go out there and change the world, you're going to have critics. Tony, you have critics. I have critics. Oh, yeah. We're trying to do the right thing. But <laughs> they're like 5% of the noise and those people are not there to support you. But here's the other hard truth. If you don't have critics and you're doing good things and you're doing you're trying to make a name for yourself and you don't have critics, it just means you're not big enough. Because mm-hmm. as soon as you start to do things that are worth noticing and people start to pay attention, you're going to get critics. Mm-hmm. But expect this. This is part of the game. And what I always tell people is, man, celebrate the hate. Because when you get that, screenshot it, share it with your close network of people that support you. And go, hey, man, I got my first hater. And it means I'm finally doing something worth noticing. Oh, yeah, dude, you're speaking my language. Uh, <laughs> you're speaking my language uh, because, dude, I used to care so much what people would say about me. I, up until I would say <laughs> several years ago, I, dude, I would start sweating every time mm-hmm. it was time for me to have group meetings, do presentations. And I would have never thought that I would have started making content. I started making content on LinkedIn because I was so freaking pissed off about what I was seeing in the corporate world. And I didn't have nobody to talk to. So I would pull out, pull out my phone and I would talk to all of these other people just to make sure that I was not freaking crazy. And they're just like, dude, dude, we get, we get it. That is some crazy stuff. Right. And it was just so cool that I was able to find my community. I was able to find people that were just uh, like me and, and using my voice and finding folks like you that said, you know, that you hid behind your logo. Yeah. If y'all listening to this, man, I look at Tony's freaking content. Oh my God. It is some of the best content that I've seen, especially on freaking LinkedIn. It is uh, amazing content. I just got lost in it. You would have never thought that, you know, he hid behind his logo. We're humans just like you all. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking about start, you have a business. If you're not thinking about starting a podcast or making some content, I will highly, highly advise you 
to start doing it right now. Start posting the stuff that might not be, you might not think that it's good enough. You'll see there's people out there that'll be like, man, I really love that. I really dig that. And you're going to get into that category what Tony was talking about where you're getting, uh, where you're getting hate. I talked a couple episodes ago. There's a whole podcast. There's two whole podcasts where they're talking nothing but smack about me. And I'm just like, <laughs> whoa, dude. And I, I love, I truly, I do this because I, I love, I love people. And I'm one of those people where we talked about before, um, I was afraid to monetize because I thought that it would, it would cheapen it. And, you know, and I just hear all of this stuff about me and I start listening to it and I just start believing it as I saw TikTok video, somebody was like, dude, freaking, you're making all this money and you can't go get Crest White strips. And I told my wife, I showed her and I was laughing about it. And she's just looking at me like, how the hell can you freaking do it? I'm like, baby, it's working. <laughs> it's working. Dude, dude, it's, it's, you know, people, people that are hurt like to hurt other people. That's, that's what we like to think about that, you know, and yeah, yeah, celebrate the hate, dude. It's and here's the thing about the, the stage fright. You're talking about when you get sweaty palms and nervous energy. I mean, guys, I had that. You get the, the cotton mouth and your, your throat kind of tightens up and you feel like the, the heat on the top of your head start to rise because that so here's here's how you get over there. Here's here's gonna raise your awareness of that, okay? Mm -hmm. Stage fright is actually you just thinking about you. It's not you thinking about serving. So as soon as you start to realize I have an audience or people that I need to educate and the expertise that I have and the love, the energy, the passion that I can put out there, I'm serving them. I'm not worried about me anymore. Mm -hmm. That's what it matters. So when you're nervous, you're worried about how do I look? How am I dressed? Am I going to forget my lines? What are my hands doing? Like all these external things that you're thinking about internally, right? Mm -hmm. Focus on serving them. When you turn that camera on, focus on talking to them and teaching them and pouring love and education or anything into them. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's a community. Ah, freaking I so many gyms today. So many gyms today. I got one last question for you, brother. It is, let's just imagine, right? It's the end of the road for you. You're getting put in the ground. And this kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier. I like you, man. I think we think a lot. This is how I always end close the shows. I, I'm curious about what would you want the, the words, the last words to be said about, about Tony, like, and it, like those words that it just make you so proud of the work that, that you've done while you were here on earth. I would answer that with my, my purpose statement. First of all, and I think about this as, you know, my, I'm on a legacy play. I'm, I'm 50 years old and I realize that time is, is running out. And my purpose is to impact the generational legacy of millions of people by teaching them confidence and business principles. The best way I'm going to impact this world is teaching confidence and business principles. Everybody out there has their own gift. Everybody out there has their own unique abilities that they can impact the world. That's what I've determined are the best ones for me because I love business even since I was a kid. And I love studying confidence and leadership. So I love the, the title of your show. So if I can instill that and change the generational legacy, because I'm not just changing my clients or the people that listen to my show, because if they were to hear the words that I'm speaking or read the writings that I create and they make positive changes in their lives, their kids are going to benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Their unborn grandkids are going to benefit from that. So I'm trying to impact generational legacy. And again, it goes back to the humility and realizing it's just not about me, but if they can remember me as some spark or catalyst, some point in their lives that led them down the right path. That's all I ask, man. Oh, I love it. I love it. So, dude, you made my eyes water, man. <laughs> what a hell of a legacy. I, I certainly see you living that legacy. And everybody that's listening to, to Leaders Lead, um, I appreciate you being a part of our show's legacy. I appreciate all of uh, the, the comments that you send, all of the well wishes. I appreciate you reaching out, letting us know how we've been able to impact your lives. Our lives are always impacted by you and hearing you all stories. Please, please, please follow my brother, uh, Tony Watley. I go to 365driven.com. Figure out how you can get him to, to give you some kind of 
uh, mentorship. He has something really special that I wish that I would have been able to capture when I first started on, on my entrepreneurial journey. You might not think that you need a coach. You not, might not think that you need a mentor. I'm telling you right now that you need somebody that's going to be able to not freaking just bark orders at you, but that somebody that's going to really, really, really walk with you uh, on this journey. So if you're one of those entrepreneurs, you need a way, you need somebody to, to walk with you on your entrepreneurial journey. I want you to reach out to Tony Watley. Go to 365driven.com. Do you have any parting words for us? No, man. I, I really love your energy. and I'm glad we got to connect. And, and I'm, I'm going to invite you to come back and go on my show because I want your Let's story. Do it. And I think that it's going to be a good one, man. You'll have a dual episode here. Oh, I, I love it. I love it. Let's do it. So y'all be looking out for, for that interview. I'm excited for it too, because I can't wait to talk about what we got going on here. So I will see y'all later. Thank you for allowing me to travel with you on your journey. I want to say thank you for the things that you're doing, the things that you've done, and the things that you're going to do, because I know that you're going to do something truly amazing. Remember, I'm here to stand by you as you chase your dreams, lead with greatness, and continue to make a difference. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. I'll see you next time on Leaders Lead the Podcast. Peace.